welcome to our fall virtual education session. We started doing these during COVID, which many of you remember was 15 years ago, um, and we've continued them along the way. And ultimately, the goal is to um, give folks an opportunity to share their work and expertise um, and also to uh, allow us all to sort of come together and, and network um, and learn from each other. I'm going to share a couple of slides, uh, just some announcements and talk about how we're going to proceed with the afternoon, um, and then we will get started. So again, I'm Brad Soboleski, the current chair of the um, AAP Section on Emergency Medicine um, Education Subcommittee. Um, under our umbrella are such things like PEMPIX and Emergiquiz and Babel Royale. Um, we also host uh, education sessions like these. Um, we have various working groups and subcommittees um, and have masterclass sessions at various educational topics, which I'll talk about in just a moment. All right. And so these uh, are our presenters today, and we'll introduce them in turn. We have Cor Corinne Bria, Michael Fish Fishman, and, and Deb Shi. Um, I did want to make some announcements um, about some folks that have taken on new roles in the section. Um, we have the Ed Education Sterling Committee Chair-Elect. In fact, I'm going to fix that as we sit here because um, you are a Sterling individual, Kelsey, but Kelsey Miller is going to take over as the Education Steering Committee Chair um, when they kick me out for telling too many dad jokes uh, in a year. So congratulations to Kelsey, who's jumped on the uh, the video there. Um, our next NCE, the National Conference and Exhibition Program Chair, is Victoria Worcester Valley from Nemours in Florida. Um, she'll take over for Jerry Rose, um, who has large shoes to fill, but we think Victoria will do a wonderful job. Um, and Vanessa Perez will be the next chair and host of PEMPIX after Manisha Agarwal does one more session. Um, so congratulations to the three of you. Um, actual and virtual claps. Okay. So we are going to give each presenter time to talk, and we've conceptualized this as a an exploration of feedback. Um, first, we'll have uh, Dr. Corinne Bria, who, um, disclosure, we were residents together back in the day. Um, and I know, like I, I helped schedule Corinne's, uh, so hopefully she's knowing uh, no ill will uh, towards some of the shifts that I gave her back in the day. Um, and then also finished PEM fellowship training in Cincinnati before moving down to, to Florida um, with her husband, who's an awesome cardiologist as well. Um, so Corinne's gonna talk about just giving feedback in the emergency department, right? We have so many learners, we're overlapping and it's hard to do and you know, meeting that mandate isn't easy, but I think the trainees deserve it. And so even from back uh, our days as a resident, Corinne was one of the best at giving feedback to people on the fly. She did it in a kind way, but a constructive way, um, and always consider it to make sure that when she said that she would give feedback to somebody, she followed through on that. And so tips on actually how to make that happen in the, in the ER. Um, and so... Simone, if we could set up Corinne to share her slides, and then we'll move on to the first presentation. All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's so nice to meet you. It's really refreshing to know that some things just really withstand the test of time. So Brad is correct. He was my uh, senior resident. He was also my chief resident. And I will tell you, nothing changes. So um, I'm flashing right back to the uh, early 2000s here with you all today. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I do think that Brad um, overinflates a little bit in the skill set that I have. I um, really subscribe to growth mentality and growth mindset and lifelong learning. And so this is always a space that I feel that I can improve on, but I'm very happy to share what I have learned and, and how we can really um, learn and grow together here. So I think we all are really, really aware of both the goal and the challenges, but I think it's incredibly important that we are intentional today in terms of really addressing that. So I think that we all lead with the best of intentions. We want to create an environment of inquiry that allows for high quality feedback. What is high quality feedback? It's timely, it's specific, it's balanced. It allows for the recipient, for the learner, to provide us feedback and also allows time for reflection. And in an ideal world would allow time for the creation of an action plan. And I know that there are, there are certain times where all of these aspects are not possible, um, but even if all of these aspects are not possible, it doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile uh, feedback, it's not worth giving. We know our environment, okay? It is busy. It is staccato. It is a hustle and bustle place. I think it's one of the reasons that we love what we do, but it also creates challenges in and of itself when we're trying to have a private, more sort of intimate, professionally intimate conversation about 
behaviors, about clinical skill development, about professional development. We have residents that we may only work with for like three hours and during our shift. Um, and so having these overlapping shifts, having this like revolving door of learners can be very challenging. I just sort of mentioned that lack of privacy, right? Like, so where I meet with my residents is like this alcove by radiology, right? Not ideal, but also it's probably the most private space that I have access to. And I really like to get creative. And then, um, it is very difficult to reflect and to assess ourselves, to do that self-assessment in a very busy environment. I think it is very few of us, even those of us who definitely lean on that more extroverted side of the Myers-Briggs scale that have difficulty with reflecting in an environment that is just constant, right? Constant people, constant um, movement, constant stimulation. And then um, I think that one of the things that where imposter syndrome really flares in this space is, oh my gosh, I didn't work long enough with this person to be able to give them this like full and complete view of who they are, like mind, body, and spirit. And I just want to really make us like recognize that we don't have to do it all. We, um, I, I really subscribe to this mentality of like, how do you eat an elephant? Well, everybody always says to me, I don't. Um, but if you did, you would eat it one bite at a time. And so we can really do this. We can really parse this out in a way that is meaningful. And it doesn't have to be all things to all people. So I really looked to the literature when I was um, when I was uh, preparing for this talk because I knew I was going to be in a virtual environment with the, the kings and queens of emergency medicine. And I wanted to make sure I was up for the challenge. And so the Council for Residency Directors in Emergency Medicine, they've done really great work in this space. And I thought that there were some real best practice that they really recommended. And so I just wanted to take a moment to just really talk through some of these. So I think we are all very, very aware of clear, specific, timely, and actionable, right? These go back to the, the old the OG SMART goals um, that we all that we all work on. I think we are all really aware too of the importance of observed behavior. So the ED is actually a great place to observe behavior because we're all fairly close, right? I don't have to go to the sixth floor. I don't have to go to the fourth floor. I literally have to just stay within the confines of my department. And so when we talk about some of the things about the emergency department that are limiting, I also want us to open our minds and expand our minds to the things that make our our work area, our clinical space, an amazing place for for patients, for learners, uh, for all of us, and the observed behavior. So we're not focusing on disposition, right? We're not focusing on jewel tone characteristics. We're focusing on behaviors. And I think this is something that's really, really important. And I think we're all really embracing this concept of um, getting feedback about behaviors, getting feedback about our skills, and how this type of feedback contributes to our professional development. Corrective and reinforcing feedback is very, very much on the table in terms of things that we can talk about. But I think it's really interesting that there is an emerging body of literature that says that the, the, the quote unquote feedback sandwich may not always be the best route to go. And I, I recognize you all as experts in this field. And so I leave this to your discretion, but there might be conversations that are simply corrective and there might be conversations that are simply reinforcing. And that is a-okay. We do not have to continue to do the, like the, the proverbial feedback stamp sandwich. It's a-okay to do it, but we can really expand our minds and say, I'm just going to focus on this. I'm just going to focus on that and that and, and feel comfortable to do that. There's lots of tools. There's lots of tools to use. We use tools all the time. We may be doing things that it was how we were trained or it's things that we learned from our mentors and we don't even know they are actual tools and they're actual ways of doing it. Um, and it, I really, really think this is an, an, an adjunct that can be very, very helpful, but I want to focus on, and I think this might be like a little, uh, a little like um, creating hype for the speakers coming after me because I'm all about like elevating and propping up um, this entire team that is presenting today. But we really need to ensure that these feedback tools are accompanied with faculty development and that we're really working together to create this culture where we're improving the quality of feedback. This cannot occur in a vacuum. It cannot be one person that's interested in this. It really has to be all of it in it together. And then really focusing, really taking that time to incorporate learner self-assessment. And again, that may not be occurring within the emergency department. This may be work that we're doing during the rotation outside of the department as part of a professional development component for our learners, but really keeping in mind that learner assessment. 
So I am somebody that really, really likes. So like, I love the cerebral, I love the proverbial, but then like, tell me like how to do it. Like, how do I like dig my hands in and get dirty, right? Let's do this. And so I really think that we do this all the time with patients and families. There is so much that we can glean from our own life experience as ED docs in terms of at the start of your shift, you do sign out. And then that is where you really start to get to know your learners, no matter what part of their shift they're on. And you really establish those expectations at the start of your shift. So we are adult learners, my loves. We are not doing five goals. We're doing one. All right. We're going to do one goal on this shift. And that is it. And I think that's part of what can sometimes paralyze us is we're like, oh, my gosh, we need to work on efficiency. We need to work on organization. We need to work on clinical reasoning, differential diagnosis, development. My friends, one one thing. And it doesn't have to be what I consider like the super sexy things about emergency medicine, right? It doesn't have to be about the uh, management in a code or near code scenario. This can be about communication. Communication is key in all parts of medicine, especially pediatrics, especially in what we do. And we can really focus in on that. I really think that assent is incredibly important in this process. So when I am meeting my learners and I'm like, hey, I'm Corinne, it's really nice to meet you. Like, tell me like, what year are you? What program are you in? What is like the most recent feedback you receive that, you know, you're comfortable telling me, what are we working on today? What are we working on this shift? What are we working on for the next few patients? I also say to them, you know, at the end of your shift, I have this little area outside of radiology that I would like to go and just talk with you for a little bit at the end of your shift. Are you okay with that? And we can sort of see how the shift's going. If something like really, really um, heartbreaking or really, really difficult comes in, we can always delay that session, that quick session. But I'm I'm really asking for about three to four minutes of your time. And, and that us sent, that expectation that I sent in that moment at the very beginning of our time together, I think really sets the stage that this is going to come to fruition. We're going to work together. We're going to be in the moment. We're going to be doing some direct observation. And then we're going to tie that up with that closure at the end. Um, I really try to pop into the room. Okay. I am not in the room with the residents for the entire thing. When I was a chief resident, I did family center rounds and I really, really loved it. But I don't think that we have the time or the bandwidth to be in with the residents, to be in with the fellows, to be in with the learners during every patient encounter. And that is not by any means my expectation, but I will definitely pop in the room and be like, Hey, I'm Dr. Bria. I'm one of the supervising docs. I just want to watch and see, like, you know, I'm, we're constantly teaching. We're constantly learning from each other. I just want to watch and see how my resident, how my fellow is doing in here. Um, and I feel like families are really, really open to this. And, and I also tell my learners that I'm going to do this. Like, you're just going to see me like zoom in. I'm going to hang out for a little bit. I'm going to zoom out. And, um, and so again, setting those expectations so that nothing is a surprise. Um, the only um, expectation of life is transition, but that doesn't mean that it's easy on any of us. And so I really try to be cognizant of that. And then really trying to, again, use that time. Guys, we do this all the time with patients, right? How much time do we have with patients? Not a lot, yet we establish trust and we establish rapport. And we do this in a very, very quick and stressful environment. We can bring that same skill set to our learners and really start early in our shift, building it in as I do as part of my sign out process. So pitfalls, I think one of the biggest things is we try to do everything all at once, right? We can really be very specific. We can pick one or two things. We do not have to like, like literally make a running commentary, ongoing feedback about the like mind, body, and soul of a learner. We can pick one behavior. We can pick one skill set and really, really focus in on that for the patients that we see while your time together. I do think that we really want to be very mindful and reflect as educators on how do we establish these expectations? How do we create this environment of inquiry where we feel comfortable observing, being observed, where we feel comfortable talking about these things in a busy environment, even though you might have a little alcove in the, in the radiology suite? And then I, I do think that despite some of our best intentions, we do fall back into old habits of like, you're doing a great job. Like the way you interacted with that family was great, right? But what made it great? What was the behavior that made it great? What was the observed behavior that you saw that you were like, oh my gosh, that put my mind at ease. That is feedback. That right there could be the whole crux of your conversation. Um, I received, um, being very transparent with you all, I received foundational feedback from my program director, the great Connie McEnany. And I remember it to this day. And that was delivered approximately 15 years ago. So this can be incredible. And I would tell you that her feedback was more corrective, right? It was more corrective than reinforcing. And it is still something that I carry with me in every room that I go in and every patient that I see. 
Um, and so I do think I spoke about this a little bit. Let us not allow the busyness of the department to dictate our ability to pop in and out of rooms. Again, we do this all the time when we're reassessing patients. Let's also apply these strategies for our learners and for our feedback platform. And then there, there could be something heartbreaking that happens at the end of your shift. And you're like, no, none of us are in a good space here to talk, right? We are not good. No one is going to take anything in. But ensuring that delayed feedback happens, okay? Making sure that you're following up via email or you're popping down to the department the next shift that the resident works to say like, hey, I know that that last shift wasn't ideal, but let's let's find time to get together and not leaving that discussion, not leaving that email, not leaving that that conversation without setting a date and a time where you are going to follow up with one another. Practice. So life is practice, right? Everything, the practice of medicine, it's called the practice of medicine for a reason. And I lean into that so, so much. So we need to practice this. And again, this is um, based in evidence, but also on my live life experience. And I'm very, very grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you all. And if you leave with one thing, pick one thing, one thing that I talked about today and just practice it and practice it and practice it. Try it on, see if she fits and then rock and roll. So thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, Corinne. Um, I am watching the chat. And so if anybody has any questions or wants to ask anything to, to Corinne, um, let me know. But I, I wanted to, to ask you why, and I know the answer, you know, we all know the answer. Why is it easier to give nice constructive feedback than it is to give corrective feedback? Like how can we get better at giving corrective feedback? Absolutely. So I think that we're all... I do think that there is a component where we're afraid of hurting others. And I think that makes us really good people. So I think that's grounded in it, a really good thing. I do think there's a component of us that might be afraid of retaliation. So like developing a reputation where the residents don't want to work with us or the fellows don't want to work with us because we give like hard feedback or we're difficult. Um, and so I do think that there's there are components of that for sure. Um, I do think, and this is something that I really learned in my chief year. And again, I just continue to um, to like hone these skills. I do think you can have difficult conversations, but not in a difficult way. And I I think that when we when we think about confrontation, we think about like a you can't handle the truth kind of moment, and that really does belong just in Hollywood, right? So I do think that when we focus on behaviors and when we we speak from what we've observed, it's a lot easier to have these conversations and to. Also always grounded in the fact that you have like you have so there's so much about like your style as a physician, your knowledge base that I um I see. And I really, really want you to be this incredible pediatrician, which you are obviously clearly on the path to become. And so based on my observations, these are this is one thing that I would like to, us to work on. And then always offering to say like, okay, and so our next shift together, we're gonna work, we're gonna work on this. And if you're not working with that person the next shift, find one of your colleagues, find one of your partners who is and be like, hey, I had this great shift with so-and-so or I had the ship with so-and-so, they're working on this and, and kind of passing that along so that we can create kind of this feedback longevity that doesn't just like sort of live and die in that shift. Um, but I do think that when we rely on observed behaviors and we rely on what we see with our own eyes and our own ears and really focus on those behaviors, that's when we can see that more transformative change. Thank you. That's a lovely message. Um, anybody in the audience have any questions for Corinne? And you can either jump in or throw it in the chat. Can you tell them in like interview mode? Do you see me like just smiling blankly at you all? Like, <laughs> hey, how are you? Why okay, so, is the program director over here? How you doing? <laughs> here's here's one that I want to ask. And so we this we run into this with our residents all the time. Um, you give wonderful feedback, whether it's constructive or corrective or both. How do you recommend that we actually get that into the system that we use? Whether it's you know MedHub or an online form a paper card that you put into a box, right? you know, because that's, that's the other end of the, the contract. I, so what are your recommendations? That I, make honestly, that I think this is like the million dollar question right now. I think that there are so many competing um, priorities and I think we're like, but we did the hard part. We had the conversation, you know, and, and, and I revert back to, again, like the medical model, right? Like if you didn't document it in the medical record, it's like, it didn't happen. And the same is true 
for for me and for us, all of us here, as we are have accountability in the development of our learners. So for me as a program director, I need it in writing because when I am meeting with the residents and we're talking about something corrective, they become Missouri. They become the show me state, right? Show me the data, show me the feedback. And I'm like, I am trying my best. Okay, I am trying my best. Um, so one of the things that I have done is um, going to di different divisions and just saying like, this is incredibly helpful for me, right? Like when you write this down, it is incredibly helpful as we are intervening, as we are doing things, as we are moving and shaking. But Brad, I think that um, one of the things that I have found to be the most helpful, and I'm sure that people have thought about this, um, but we build in time um, at like, different meetings. It's not always division meetings where um, people will have access. We MedHub on their phone. I do not care. Like you could do MedHub on the moon. I do not care where you do it. I just want you to do it. And so we try to build that in. I think of it as the QR code at the end of a workshop sort of mentality. So when am I going to fill out that survey when you build in five to seven minutes at the end of something where I have that time set aside? And again, it's not a perfect system because we can't, no matter how hard we try to build that time into a shift, like the inevitable occurs and like some Someone comes in seizing, right? So it's it's just not sustainable within our department. But I think that trying to build that time into other academic or other educational sort of sessions uh, is important. We really try to stay away from group evaluations. Um, I know it is a bit easier, but I do worry that the loudest voices then reign supreme and we don't get that most accurate assessment. And then we also need that milestones data, right? So like if there are 15 of us in the room and we're doing a group evaluation, we have one data point. I need those 15 data points. So it, it is, this is a really hard one. And I, I do not have all the answers here, but I'm very happy to brainstorm, very happy <laughs> to share my live life experience, because I think that this is something that we're all working on. I think we all crave feedback. And I think that as faculty, we really know that the onus is on us to deliver it. And we get that we're in it. It's just very, very difficult. And sometimes we have to just sort of sit in that hard and that sticky and then figure out, okay, what are some best practices that are reasonable that we're able to accomplish? Yeah. So I will give you one more question, Corinne, and then there's one from Jacques, if you don't mind answering it in the chat. Um, uh, the next two sections, we'll move on to our fish and then Deb. We're going to talk about actually instituting a system and then making sure that you make that stick because we need some sort of structure to get the faculty to do that. Then Deb's going to talk from a professional development, faculty development, um, and holding us all accountable, you know, for that, that contract. And so we'll sort of build on this, but the one I wanted was a great question from Rosemary. Um, you know, the, the personality traits, and we know that some of those are, are, you know, baked into issues of gender and medicine, um, or they're just, you know, you know, things that we throw in there because we can't think of anything better. So, you know, how, how do you give feedback or avoid giving feedback on personality traits, you know, confidence, lack of humility, aloofness, or, you know, positive traits? Do you want me to answer it in the chat, Brad, or do you want me to answer it? Answer, right why don't you answer Jacques' uh, question about constructive and corrective in the chat, but I would love for everybody to hear about how you incorporate on personality traits, because I mean, generally sure. our pediatricians are really nice. Yeah. Sure. And Stanley, I will answer you in the chat, my love. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, so um, so there I ground this in behavior. There is a reason we are seeing behaviors that are causing us to think this. And what are those behaviors, right? Is the overconfidence sort of the way that we um, talk to families, right? So um, communication is 80% nonverbal, right? So like, what are those behaviors that we're seeing that are conveying that sense of overconfidence? What are those behaviors that we're seeing that are, that are sending the message that I'm not very confident in what I'm saying and that when I'm in the treatment room, I need to really own that space as the leader. And I think that some of this could be more in like a leadership development, like sort of framing it more in leadership development, which would be behavior based. The lack of humi hum humility, the aloofness, some of this may be more interpersonal, right? It may be more observations of how you see with colleagues and the work relationships that we have with our colleagues are as important as the relationships we have with our patients and their families. And so I think that if we go back to grounding these things in behaviors that we are observing and, and being specific in that, we can bring shed a light. I think we are, all have to accept this fact that sometimes this 
feedback is incredibly hard to hear. And the person is not going to hear it the first time around. They're not going to hear it the fifth time around. You know, if we have to talk about smoking cessation with families and patients, like 15 to 20 times, like we're going to have to talk about this more than once, but we have to join this fight together. So we have to bring awareness to it, ground it in behaviors. And then again, I think some of these more personality-based traits, I think um, the foundationally uh, approaching it, like as leadership development, like in medicine, as a physician, you are a leader. Um, and these are the sort of some of those behaviors that we would like to see. So extinguish these and elevate these. Um, I think that's one of the ways that I have, um, I, that, that's one of the ways that I've approached the personalities. Um, the ones that I don't like is like, you're so quiet, you know, like, no, that's because I'm introverted. So like back off. Right. So I, I feel like um, the, we can go in more of a leadership direction with some of the examples that were given in the chat. And that's been, I've had success in that, in that space. Yeah. Bryn, thank you very much. We will come back and bring everyone together at the end. So you have not yet gotten the complete Carimbria experience. Um, we're going to move on to Fish, Michael Fishman, who is a, a fellow at Boston Children's. And so I first uh, met, met you, Fish, on a, on a call to develop um, a fellow's handoff. Right. And so where residents are going into fellowship and developing a a process for residency program directors and fellowship leadership to sort of hand off that fellow and provide ongoing feedback and areas for improvement. So even in your young career, uh, Fish is doing a lot of work and understanding how these systems of feedback work. Um, he's going to talk specifically about um, work locally and trying to both institute and maintain a feedback system. So the floor is yours or the sea is yours, I guess. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me be part of this amazing panel and so excited to talk and learn about a topic that I care very deeply about. Um, as Brad mentioned, I'm going to be kind of focusing a little bit more on maybe, you know, we just got a ton of great information about how maybe on an individual level, we can be better at giving feedback, receiving feedback, being part of this feedback dialogue. But how can we maybe standardize it, do it at a division level? How can we implement educational intervention? Um, amongst a group of faculty or amongst students and hope that we can sustain and actually see development and change from that. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is a project that we uh, have started in our emergency department at Boston Children's Hospital titled Utilizing Co-Regulated Evaluations, which I'll call CORE for short and for a pithy title, to optimize feedback and evaluations. And from an important acknowledgement standpoint, this is work being done by a phenomenal group of educators, really being led by Sarah Cavallero and Kelsey Miller, who we just heard about, is going to be leading the steering committee as well. So I want to give all of the credit to them as well. So a quick bit of background about our emergency department. I'm going to be focusing on medical students because that's where our intervention has started, but you could apply this to other uh, different levels of trainees as well. But for say sub I students, they would be assigned their like month long emergency medicine rotation and they would show up to their clinical shift. They would do their clinical shift. Maybe feedback would be given with the attending, maybe it's not, who knows what happens. It's just the lived experience. Some are better, some are worse, who knows. And then the attending gets a notification that they have an evaluation to complete about the student that they will hopefully complete, but may not always complete. And then that evaluation either gets amalgamated into kind of like a narrative summary at the end that then gets sent to the student or they get the individual evaluations, but often significantly after the fact. And this had been the process previously and is the process across most of the residency as well. And so the group of educators here thought if there is a way to improve this process to make feedback better. And a lot of the concepts that went into this educational intervention are really kind of self-regulation and co-regulation. And so self-regulation, I think, is the concept that most of us are probably more familiar with, or at least resonates or makes more sense. You know, this is like when you think of the stereotypical ideal learner, it's someone who sets their own goals, monitors their own development, is reflective, seeks out feedback, seeks out their own learning opportunities. But we're starting to see this growing idea and recognition of something called co-regulation, especially understanding how much learning happens in the social environment. Uh, and you can really think of co-regulation as like the zone of proximal development for self-regulation. And so it's the idea of using like an external individual or external support to guide someone's self-regulation. So an example might be a student who really wants to work on suturing with their ED attending. And so the student has already self-regulated and they're like, I really want to work on suturing on this shift. And so they let the attending know. And the attending identifies maybe a patient case that might be useful for that and lets the student know, hey, if you 
see patient in room seven, I think that'd be a great case for you to practice your suturing skills on. And then maybe before the student goes into the room, the attending might ask the student, what materials are you thinking of using for this? What's your approach going to be to start seeing what is like the strategic planning that the student is doing? You're kind of co-regulating that process. And then if the attending has time to pop into the room and supervise, then can always, as they're going through it, talk to them, you know, like, how do you think things are going? How's your technique going? And, you know, that's kind of like reflecting in action that they're helping to regulate it as well. And then maybe afterwards, doing some reflection afterwards, you know, how do you think that went? Were there any barriers, things you could work on next time? And so these are just examples of how kind of a third party can co-regulate a student's kind of learner's development and then amplify their own self-regulation process. So it's with this idea of co-regulation in mind that this educational intervention was really built around. And so the new process that was done was that students still show up to their clinical shifts, see all their patients, do a normal clinical encounter. But this time, the feedback form that was previously sent to attendings after shifts were completed was provided to the student before the shift. And the student actually completes the feedback form themselves. So they do kind of like a self-reflection and complete the form during or immediately after the shift. And then they quickly sit down with the attending immediately after the shift and they review the feedback. So they review the student's self-analysis and their own reflections on their feedback. And then the attending can edit for clarity or for additional nuance or anything else they want to add. And then it's submitted together then. And so that's kind of the co-regulated process. So you kind of establish this contract at the beginning that the student's like, hey, we're going to meet at the end. We're going to do feedback together. I'm going to do self-reflection first. And then we're going to work together to see what am I you know, have good insight on, what are things I can work on, what are things that I'm actually being harsher on myself than I need to be, and how can I move on and get better. And so in terms of implementation, in terms of like a pilot study, this was focused on medical students completing advanced clinical electives. So really you can think of them as your sub eyes. And in terms of rollout, so the students were informed prior to starting the rotation of this new process and what they needed to do, which is really just fill out the form during their clinical shift and talk to the attending to review it. And from a faculty standpoint, there were division-wide kind of education and announcements, and then kind of theories of reinforcements to remind them of this new process, just because there's a lot of an institutional momentum of doing it the previous way. In terms of analysis of the data, so this was all compared against the year prior to the intervention. And so looking at written evaluations, there's both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis of this. And so over 200 written student evaluations were analyzed. And then for all of the students that performed kind of the new core intervention, they underwent semi-structured interviews that underwent their own qualitative analysis to kind of get information that couldn't just be gleaned from the written student evaluations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found is this core intervention has been going on for about 15 months now. That's like over 170 shifts of this new process. And like I've talked about, over 200 written student evaluations that we've been able to look through. And so from a written evaluation standpoint, from a quantitative findings, we found that these students complete 15 shifts during their rotation. And so prior to this intervention, we were seeing about five out of 15 evaluations being completed. And now with this intervention, you know, median of 15 out of 15. So we've seen a 200% increase from that standpoint. In terms of total word count, we've seen that double going from about 800 to 1600 words. So quantity, we're seeing a lot more feedback. What about quality? And so Karen already talked about a lot of the things that make feedback good feedback. And so in terms of specific behaviors mentioned from about half of all evaluations to now the vast majority of all evaluations have specific behaviors. Specific clinical examples go from like a third to over two thirds of evaluations now comment with specific clinical examples talking about, you know, what are those observed behaviors? What are these specifics that they can really tie it back to? And we talked about personality comment, uh, personality traits, which I fully agree with. There's a difference between a behavior and a label. You know, being overconfident is a label, but it doesn't define the behavior. And so trying to limit the labels that we provide and focusing more on the behaviors that led to the label. And so here we actually see, just with this process, we're actually decreasing personality trait comments while still increasing specific behaviors. So both quantity and quality of feedback is going up. But we also recognize there's lots of interventions that have been targeted at improving quantity and quality of feedback that have seen good results. So there's not anything maybe super unique with core from this standpoint. But I think what the unique thing was came out during the student interviews and the qualitative analysis of what was happening on the student side. And so 
through those interviews, what we found was that there's a lot of baseline challenges. And Clint already talked about a lot of these as well, that you know, in the emergency department and in general, there's a lot more summative than formative feedback. And their students really desire this formative feedback. They want stuff that they can act on to grow and show growth. Psychological safety is difficult in the emergency department and definitely in the ED compared to maybe other settings, this lack of continuity. Maybe have one shift with an attending, maybe have half a shift with an attending. It's hard to kind of build that relationship, that educational alliance that you should have. But what students found with the core intervention is that it really grew their self-regulation. It started encouraging them and giving them a space and an expectation to set goals for themselves. They sought out more feedback because they were given a space where they were expected to, and it was normal that you know asking for feedback was the expectation and there wasn't this fear of hierarchy. And we always talk about how sometimes you have to label feedback, otherwise trainees won't see it. But we found that regardless of that, students notice more feedback just from the core. When you tell them and prime them that this is gonna be a feedback enhanced clinical shift, that they notice it more and then they reflect a lot more. What we found, at least on the students' ends, was that this had a lot of impact on these baseline challenges. It increased the feedback that they got and they noticed. They got way more timely feedback. They actually felt psychologically safe because they entered an environment where the expectation was already that you were going to have this feedback conversation. And they actually felt like it built the relationship because, like we mentioned, from the get-go, the ascent, the, the expectations were there from the beginning, that there was already a relationship set in place, and they could just build on that. And so just some quick quotes to give examples of what the students are saying. So as a student, not having a setup on how to get feedback can be a barrier. And the fact that this was emphasized from the beginning to do this every day, just a part of my daily checklist, have a conversation with the attending. It allows you to grow quicker because you have a goal in mind. What did I need to think about from yesterday so that today can be a better day? I don't think I would have been as conscious to hearing it, but I would hear it and tailor my actions moving forward. It made me put in more effort to hearing feedback. I think most importantly, what this I think might hopefully do is make me a little less reticent to just have that conversation. I have to do it even when I'm not on emergency medicine. I think that's actually an important skill. And it's that concept of growing self-regulation that we thought was actually really impressive and really unique about this, that not only are we making feedback, you know, they got more feedback, they got better feedback. And when you actually look at the content of feedback, it's, you know, in terms of EPAs, it's prioritized differential history and physical exam and, uh, a good differential and good oral presentation. So the content of the feedback was there. They got more of it and they got better of it, but it also made them grow as self-regulated learners, which is something that's lasting that will help amplify their development in any other setting, even when they leave the ED, even in other places that aren't implementing some kind of intervention like this. So the question is, well, what about the attending? So this is kind of a two-way dance. And so we started doing interviews and kind of get some analysis of data from the attendings as well. And out of the 50-ish attendings that have responded, about half of them have had experience with both core and the prior example. And we found that the majority find core easier and the vast majority prefer core to the previous model. And in terms of sustainability, we're also seeing here that as this has gone on, we've been able to iterate on it, that we've been able to keep the process less variable and that it's been consistent through. So the students are seeing you know, high levels of both verbal and written feedback. And like we talked about, you need to have it documented for it to count. And so not only are they having the verbal feedback, but this written feedback, the attendings are testing and they're editing and they're adding to what the students have written as well. And so kind of ending with takeaways is from an intervention standpoint, it's feasible and non-inferior to our prior evaluation system. And I would easily argue that it's quite superior. It's a possible solution to improve the quality and quantity of feedback, but more importantly, it might develop self-regulatory behaviors in our trainees, which is really going to be a lifelong skill. Next steps is ensuring honest and accurate feedback. And so there's always the question whether attendings feel like they can provide accurate feedback when they're, you know, editing something that the students already written. But I think that's not an issue with the intervention. That's just an issue in general. And I ascribe to the personal belief that, you know, students should never read feedback and find it surprising that if there's something that's written in feedback it should have hopefully been discussed with the student before and how do you expand this to maybe other learners in the emergency department without increasing the attending burden knowing that there are lots of different learners that end of shift can be quite busy as well so just being thoughtful about kind of the time constraints that are there and how to keep it implemented and evolve so lessons learned so student driven is helps with the sustainability and we all know there's a lot of talk about you know adding assessment burden to students but in this case 
we found that the students actually kind of desire this kind of thing because it's something that they get feedback, they get formative feedback, and it's a very short form. It's just two or three questions that they get to fill out. You know, you continue to include new student orientations, orienting faculty, new hires to build that institutional knowledge and momentum, and then really having key stakeholder buy-in. So share successes with them. So in orientation, telling them, you know, what students have loved about this, what it's really helped. And same with faculty. So division faculty meetings, research presentations, just like this as well. And then making sure to iterate and optimize on it. So, you know, when, you know, the students written comments where a feedback conversation didn't happen or it happened, but the faculty couldn't complete written attestation, checking in and seeing, you know, what are the barriers? Are there systems level issues that we can work to tweak to make it better? Um, but overall, really just an intervention where the feedback form itself did not change. The questions were the same. We just said, hey, students, why don't you give a shot at it first and then work with the attending afterwards? And that's the expectation. And we found that it's made a big difference. And huge thanks to allowing me to share here and happy to answer any questions. All right. Fish, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And then the incorporation of educational theory um, and really thinking about how you grounded the intervention in that um, was wonderful. And you know, I'm wondering, you know, you you made a silly comment at the, be at the beginning about it having an acronym, but so much of of getting things to stick, it is a little bit about like branding and and advertising and building awareness. Um, so how much work went into making sure the faculty were aware that this is just not another thing you have to do. This is a change. This is a change that that we think will be positive. Um, and did that help with buy-in? Yeah. So I think that's a great question. I I think. Uh, Kelsey's here as well, so I'll let her jump in if there's anything that I miss because she has way more sway over the faculty than, than I do. But I think a lot of it is just the buy-in is is introducing as a concept, but saying, you know, like, what is the win for them? So faculty, when they do this, they no longer get that email afterwards. That this is their evaluation. Like, it's done then in the moment after shift. They don't have to get it two weeks later and be like, I don't really remember who the student was. And then they end up writing this, like, generally did great and then things get really vague and it's not so helpful for anyone um and i think just reinforcing you know like as you go through the first student when the first student is coming on maybe checking in with that first attending being like hey just a reminder this is the new process and then as you iterate on and it builds some momentum it becomes easier to kind of teach the faculty and then as you're able to present the data and then present the wins both for faculty and for students it is now become a much better process where I think the expectations are there. The students are also part of it. It's a two way, it's not just like only the faculty know they're doing the students. Maybe if the faculty forget the students show up and they're like, hey, like I'm gonna fill out this form. We're gonna talk about it afterwards. And the attendings are like, oh yeah, I remember being told about this. Easy, great, we'll do it. And so I think those are helpful, like low, low activation energy, but wins and something that is like kind of reinforced over time. And I would imagine the medical school and the division leadership, you know, throwing muscle behind it and saying like, yeah, we're doing this, uh, went a long way in terms of making it stick. Yeah, that's my understanding. <laughs> Deb is smiling because she knows that that is part of the, the big challenge. Um, and so Kelsey said, um, there, uh, uh, Jason Woods brought up a, a very erudite question um, about observed behaviors and making sure that it's not a surprise for the resident. We'll kind of save that and we can bring that up in the dis discussion at the end. Um, you know, but what Kelsey said in response to Jason's question about that was that, you know, students are often provided the inroads to allow the negative feedback by hearing some of it on shift. And so it's, you know, the, the sort of summary of that is that it's probably better to get it in early and, and sort of get ahead of it and introduce it to the student rather than waiting till later. Um, and Kelsey says it was harder to talk about positive feedback than negative feedback. Um, have you found that to be true, Fish? Yeah, and so obviously I think what Jason mentioned, there's no one, you know, feedback is is personal as well. And there's no one system that's going to work for every single person, both deliver, recipient, or the dialogue. And so there's always going to be times where, you know, as in when as you become more expert, you kind of have to figure out what's what's right in the moment. Um, but in talking to the students and doing the interviews and really reading through they're actually in general much harsher critics of themselves than the attendings were. I think whether that's they are just trying to like set or lower expectations, but they came in really harsh on themselves and the attendings often were giving more reinforcing feedback or like just saying like, yes, that is something to work on, but able to give nuances and like kind of focus where the learning would be within them. They're like, oh, my presentations aren't that good. And they're able to kind of like, 
oh, that's not true. You know, there's good parts and there's parts to work on and let's focus on those things. And so they actually struggled a lot more with hearing positive feedback because I think there's a lot of this imposter syndrome that goes on. And they were like, give me all the constructive feedback. And they would kind of just like feel like they get into this like kind of awkward space when the attending was like, oh, I thought you did this really well for these reasons. And they kind of were just like, let's let's move on from it. It was kind of interesting to to hear. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you one more before we move on to, to Deb, our third presenter. Um, obviously, most of us won't have the embedded system that you're using so successfully locally. How do you recommend, it, even if we want to try this out, um, building on what Corinne told us before, um, just try this out with a, with a couple learners on your next shift. How could we actually actualize this with them in a, in a low low-fi, low-tech sort of way? Yeah, I think on an individual level, and Corinne brought it up, I think the most important thing is like really setting that edu like that alliance, like setting the expectations at the beginning is so important. So, you know, in an ideal world, the attending and the student both come in, they see each other and they're like, what do you want to work on? And they're like, I want to work on this at the same time. And you're like, oh, this is going to be a great shift. But, you know, because of many systems and individual things, maybe that doesn't always work. So as an attending, one thing you could, or as like the supervisor, one thing you could control is like, in that moment, when you have like a down second with the team, just identifying the learners and just being like, hey, maybe you don't have to answer me at this moment, but I want this shift to be as like optimal and like full of learning as possible. Think about one or two things that you want to work on for this shift. And we're going to focus on those and we're going to make sure to check in towards the end of the shift about those as we can go through. So just setting that expectation that feedback is going to be a part of it. We're here to really maximize learning. I'm here to coach you. And maybe it's not so much like an evaluative nature that we know that that is part of it. I think is probably the single most important thing. Yeah. And then have them bring that to the table, them start the discussion, and then you mm -hmm. pull in your experience and, and do it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fish. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, Deb, our third and final presenter. Then we'll have a chance to connect with everybody there. Um, Deb's a professor of emergency medicine at Stanford. I'm the chair of division of pediatric emergency medicine. And aside from being awesome for years at AAP and the best meeting uh, leader and collaborator uh, that I've, I've worked with along the way, also has built a career on feedback from trainees on all the way up to faculty colleagues. And we started at the personal, we moved to the systematic. Now let's talk about um, everything from assuring the trainees get it to program accreditation. So, so good afternoon, everybody, and um, officially here in on the West Coast, it is the afternoon, although I started in the morning. I know the rest of you guys are towards the end of your day. So it's so nice to see everyone um, see. And, um, and, and I've got to thank Corinne and Fish for um, your part of this um, presentation because you totally, I hope, set me up for success. So I'm going to um, speak about documenting feedback um, that not only um, ensures program accreditation, but also facilitates trainee growth. And hopefully what we're going to be doing is to minimize work that faculty and other people who provide um, feedback have to do to make sure that all of our individual programs um, fulfill requirements to stay accredited. Um, and Brad, I will touch on faculty um, development a little bit, but really what I'm going to focus more on is um, to minimize faculty development uh, to do this documentation. Okay, so, you know, this is, there's this age old, what's feedback? What's evaluation? And, and in my career that has now spanned uh, quarter of a century as faculty, um, I think, uh, you know, we've really moved from, I hope, from doing feedback in person at the bedside, but not documenting, as Corinne um, alluded to, and as you guys have asked about, to, to how do we then um, document what we actually say? Um, and and for, for trainees, really, I mean, we have to submit evaluations. It has to be written, um, but evaluations that are submitted throughout their fellowship, throughout their residency, through, throughout medical school are meant to be formative, um, and, and it's only summative for the end of the rotation or end of whatever training period that they are in. And so then how do we incorporate what is actually um, fed back to them 
um, on a daily basis to to be written in a, a meaningful way um, that goes into their records or or not. So just just to step back a little bit, why do we have to do this? Well, at the very simple simplest level, if we have accredited programs, we have to submit reports that are written. And so for um, GME trainees, we have ACGME milestones reports that have to be submitted semi-annually. And then at the ABP level, for those, um, for those of us who are um, uh, doing ABP residency or um, Penn Fellowship um, program direction, um, ABP requires an annual competence um, evaluation and, and this um, schematic on, on the right are those competency evaluations that have to be completed for each one of your trainees on an annual basis. And then, um, and, and then at the end of fellowship or residency, program directors have to put in a, um, a statement of I certify the evaluations are an accurate reflection of this physician's competence as a subspecialist or as a general pediatrician upon completion of fellowship. Okay, and in the past, and as a former program director of a Penn fellowship and a former pro, um, associate program director of a Pease residency before, I've had to submit these types of um, statements and sometimes with not so much data to support it. Um, and, and so, so then, um, uh, thankfully, I, I think we're doing better from the standpoint of having supporting data now, but what can we do to make it even better? And, um, and so now I'm going to talk about EPAs um, and specifically competency-based medical education. And so why is that important? Well, um, for all of you who are um, looking to get ABP certified or maintain, um, maintain certifications, in 2028, ABP is going to be incorporating EPA-based assessments for initial um, certification. So it's important. So um, I'm hoping at this point you guys have heard about milestones and EPAs, but just really briefly, right? Milestones, um, this is the historicals on it, were first created um, by the ACGME with um, different uh, stakeholders engaged. Um, and for PEM, we got our first set of milestones in um, 2014. Um, and since then, it's been re revised. And the ones that we are currently utilizing is from July 2022. And a bunch of the PEM um, folks, um, several of you who are on this call, um, was involved in doing this work. Um, and then uh, back in 2016, when milestones were being just talked about, we ABP also at that time started work on developing um, entrustable professional activities. And um, our PEM community um, worked on developing um, entrustable professional activities um, through actually the AAP SOEM Fellowship Program Director Subcommittee. And, um, and we published um, the results of our project at that time in 2016. And those EPAs um, have undergone minimal um, revisions since then, and those are the EPAs that the ABP will be using um, to, to assess, um, to ask us to assess our fellows um, and our general pediatric, um, um, general pediatric trainees um, on separate sets of EPAs and such. So, so what's all this? Why do we care? Um, you guys should all be aware of this continuum, um, continuum of EPAs to core competencies to milestones. Um, these are all parts of the competency-based medical education framework, and truly all of it is um, critical to assessment processes. And so, so um, the EPAs are meant to be more of a wide-angle view. So a specific PEM EPA, um, and there's um, six of them, um, one of them is to recognize and provide um, care for acutely ill and or injured pediatric patients in the ED. And, and then for each one of these EPAs, there are core competencies that we think um, and, and milestones, which we think um, uh, contribute to how trainees may be able to perform um, or ex execute these EPAs. And so, so um, why are we moving towards EPA-based assessments? Well, um, for the better part of 10 years now, I think um, there's been um, a community of pediatric, general pediatric um, 
ed educators along with pediatric subspecialist educators who have developed um, um, level of supervision scales um, for EPA-based assessments. And those level, level of supervision scales have been um, validated and we published those results in multiple papers um, over the course of the last several years. And so, um, so this, this has all of that work in these last 10 plus years has now hopefully culminated into something that we can utilize at the per shift level for those of us working ED shifts to provide not just um, verbal feedback, but to actually document feedback. So how do we do that? Well, there are, you know, there are mobile apps. These did not exist when I first started. And, and really one of the things about evaluation, written evaluation is that it has to be feasible and feasible means uh, minimizing the number of clicks that we have to get to the evaluation that we have to for, um, fill out. And then it also means that we cannot expect really, really busy faculty who are so tired from seeing 20 plus uh, patients, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less, taking care of not just one, but maybe five trainees on a shift with them, right? And so whatever form they have to fill out needs to be short. And so the advent of mobile apps have frankly required us to have um, evaluation forms that are shorter and easier to fee, um, fill out. Um, and, and really now there are forms that are available um, that require faculty less than five minutes and sometimes less than one minute to complete, okay? Now, um, those of you guys who have to use um, institutionally required um, mobile apps to um, as a platform to deliver these types of evaluations, um, know that MedHub and New Innovations have have these apps available. But what I'm going to spend a little bit more time on talking about today is um, this these simple uh, or this is a mobile app um, that is called Simple. Simple stands for Society for Improving Medical Professional Learning, um, and this was an app that was um, uh, that was created out out of University of Michigan, and now and it was it, it is now a nonprofit international consortium of training programs. Um, they've worked really hard to implement evidence based educational system, and um, this was first created for surgery and um, for for documentation of procedural competence um, and um, and they they actually that group has uh, um, sorry published on on a lot of their work um, you, you can just PubMed simple and probably find a lot of um, papers on that but um, since since surgery started utilizing this emerges both emergency medicine residencies and now pediatric residency programs have started utilizing this particular platform to deliver um, to deliver evaluations and feedback to um, their trainees. The pediatric pro residency program pilot just started, and that one, that particular program or that particular project is actually been, being spearheaded by Ariel Wynn at Boston Children's. I know Fish and Kelsey both know know her and um, and probably um, contributed to to the work that was being done. Um, but why am I talking about this? Well, we are getting ready to start a project within PEM as well, but I'll talk more about that. Um, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about simple though. Okay, so so this is kind of the like the fields that you see when you open that simple app. And essentially here at Stanford, what what I get is this app, I click open, and now we we are in PEM submitting um, these uh, evaluations for both um, EM residents and PEDS residents. Okay, and what what this particular app does is we click this plus button to create a new um, evaluation, and then that when then the next window we see is actually a window that I didn't um, include here, but it's it allows us to select which resident um, we want to provide the evaluation for, and then we get to select one, one EPA, 
to evaluate the resident on. And then, then here's the scale that we use for EM residents. This is a level of supervision scale, right? And so from a supervisor view, we have, I had to do it. I helped a lot or I helped a little. I needed to be there, but did not help. And I didn't need to be there at all. Okay. So in terms of faculty development, this is the only faculty development that we really had to do, except to say, you guys need to do this to my group of 15, right? Because fundamentally as supervisors, right? This is a really easy thing to think of, right? Makes inherent sense. And so, so then after you um, provide that one, one point rating, then you're allowed, um, or we are allowed to provide more, um, more verbiage on feedback. What, we, what went well today? And then what goals do we have for, for the next time that this particular trainee may um, encounter um, having to perform this particular EPA? And, and I will say that my personal practice I, I do what Corinne do, do, does. I try to give um, feedback for every single patient that I staff with trainees. And, and I usually only pick one thing to really talk about unless they ask me other questions, okay? And then, so then the written feedback that I give on the, these, on the, um, via the simple app is pretty much what I said to them. Okay, and so to Fishes, um, uh, point this way, I hardly ever provide eva um, evaluations, written evaluations that are, that are a surprise to, um, to the trainee. Okay. I'm not going to read everything that I wrote, but you can, I mean, this is more for you guys to see what it can look like. All of this, while it took me more than five minutes to describe, took me about two minutes to do, and I can do it during my shift or I do it right after my shift is over. Okay. And so when we started all of this, and mind you, we have data within my PEM group here, which is a small but mighty group. I have 15 faculty, 15 of us. We started um, providing these types of evaluations truly since January of 2024. So we are now in the 11th month. And since then, our group has um, provided almost 400 evaluations. 400, okay? And, and is it perfect? Absolutely not. I don't have everybody. <laughs> I, I still have the faculty who, who are just not gonna do it. But for the faculty who um, do routinely do it, while our requirement is only one evaluation per trainee encountered per shift. Okay, so probably less than 10 minutes work for all of the trainees that we work with. Most of us only get to work with about two trainees per shift. Okay, and, uh, but some of my faculty who have bought into this, um, they find it so easy that sometimes they submit five <laughs> because they're so happy. Yes, okay. So, so feasible. Um, and, and then where are we going in PEM? We are going to recreate this um, for PEM fellows. And some of you guys on this call know that you will be serving as a pilot program. Um, and um, so essentially what we're going to do is imp implement EPA-based evaluations for PEM fellows um, using this simple app. Um, we are going to fund it from my institution here to do this study. It has been AVP approved, um, and we're really uh, looking forward to getting it started. We expect uh, implementation to start in academic year 2026. Um, and these are the other spickings of the project. Um, and I can talk more about this in, in a minute, but I'm going to end. Uh, oh, and then how do we then um, meet ACGME requirements of reporting milestones, which is different than EPAs. Well, I alluded to there's a group of us in PEM who and, and then other pediatric subspecialties um, worked last year on mapping milestones 
and core competencies onto each one of our EPAs. And the APP has now um, provided us with this EPA to milestones mapping tool. It's, um, you can, anybody can get to it uh, using this link down here, okay? And um, by doing that, what you can see is, this is just an example of one EPA. Um, and the core competencies or the sub competencies and the individual um, uh, sub sorry sub competencies that got uh, mapped to this particular EPA and um, what programs can do is put in at uh, what level was a fellow assessed um, re as um, requiring what level of supervision did, did they need for this particular EPA and then once they do that then this tool actually spits out what milestones level at each of these sub competencies they would. And then this way, um, each individual program will then have milestones um, report, a milestones report that can then be vetted with clinical um, competency committees to make sure that the milestones that were assessed for each of their fellows um, kind of makes sense. So. I'm going to leave you guys all with this. This work that we do with feedback and evaluation isn't new. Okay. There's things, uh, papers that have been published since some of you guys weren't born. Um, and I'll leave you with why, why should we do this? In the end, we want to advance our subspecialty. We want to make sure that the trainees that we're providing this feedback evaluation for um, are going to be able to take care of children and specifically my grandchildren. Okay. Um, and so trainees don't perform required skills incorrectly on purpose. That's 1991. Feedback for, for those of you who um, are striving to stay in academics and you do it because you like to teach. Well, giving feedback and providing evaluations is something that we have to do, okay? And, but for you specifically though, feedback ranks second out of 37 preceptor behaviors that most enhance learning for your trainees. Um, and if you do do this um, in an effective manner, your trainees are going to think that you are an effective teacher. Yeah, thank you very, what was number one? If feedback was number two, what was Dude. number one? Yeah, I know, I can't remember, sorry. <laughs> It's been a long time. Uh, excellent dad jokes, probably. Um, so the the concept of entrustable professional activities, I think the, the name is a little bit of a, a barrier at first, but I think the way that you laid it out and the way that it's often presented is, you know, how much did you actually need to supervise this trainee? Did you need to be there to hold their hand and do it for them versus could you have just been absent? Do you think that that's helped faculty um, understand a bit more the content of the evaluations that they're submitting and the, the layer that EPAs have added on top of the milestones? Yeah. So um, the, the quick answer to that is absolutely. When, when they, my experience with all of this has been that when faculty don't have to think about really what, what did the trainee do, even if they observe them doing it, right? How do I assess based on a competency level? Are they um, are they an advanced beginner, or are they competent, or are they proficient, or are they um, experts? Well, those those kinds of assessments are to the eyes of the beholder, and there's going to be some variation in how how that assessment happens. What I consider competent um, may may be different than what you consider competent, right, Brad? Um, and so, so then utilizing level of supervision scales, where it's now being, it, it's now going to the faculty thinking about, okay, how much help did I need to give this, this particular um, trainee? That's a little bit easier to, um, to think about. And, and we found that there was um, perhaps a little bit less variation. I think I'll ask one more before we open the the floor to talk to all three of our, our presenters. Um, and you mentioned that some of your faculty may never submit an evaluation, right? We have that as well. We'll get um, emails from the level of the trainee, like, hey, these three residents did not get any narrative evaluation comment. And then they'll send it individually to the faculty that worked with them and say, come on, 
chip in here, but um, what do you recommend from from that standpoint of making sure that we as divisions and division leadership hold faculty accountable to actually do their job? Okay, so that's the hard question. <laughs> yeah, so here here's what I would say. Um, different institutions have different priorities and also different ways of being able to reward um, expected behavior. Um, here at our institution, um, where faculty incentive compensation, <laughs> hey, uh, which is beyond the base salary, um, there, there are um, expected, expected behaviors that are tied to to that incentive plan. And so, so it will, um, it does hit people's purses. Now I know that some other institutions don't have the incentive plan. And so, um, so for something like that, then um, perhaps coming to a group consensus about what, what is it that we should do, right? What's right for our group? And then how might we reward it beyond base pay or incentive pay, right? Um, do we set goals um, that hold us accountable? Um, and then, but, but in the end, by going to a system like this, what I found is that the faculty who are not submitting are the exceptions and not the rules. And so, so then there's this hurt effect, and and I I have individual conversations with them in a non-threatening way, Corinne. Yeah, that's very encouraging. When one of the um, biggest barriers is I forgot my MedHub login. Uh, yeah. Faculty, and then in sitting there um, doing the 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 carrot and the stick, the, yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to to give folks. Um, in uh, in attendance, the time to to jump on and ask questions for our presenters, or to throw them in the chat, and then I can um, uh, moderate, and we'll do that for the next few minutes before we log off. And um, uh, can I ask a question a of this yeah, audience? Jump in. So first, uh, uh, Fish, Deb, and Corinne, this is a fantastic presentation. It stimulates a lots of great conversations and lots of thoughts along those lines. So. You know, as a former program director, I am uh, all about the feedback as well as getting it. The question I have to this group is about quantity versus quality, right? In the sense that we are doing, I think, a much better job than other subspecialties because we are leading in terms of getting feedback to our trainees. Uh, and we've always been a leader relative to pediatrics. But the questions that I often get from other subspecialties are, but what is the effect, right? As a scientist, like, is this uh, accelerating their development on the, the developmental scales that you, you have? Is there data to support that? And then also, what about the recipient? Are we looking at the resistance to change and the adaptability and moldability of our trainees to accept the feedback and incorporate them to the future? And so, those are questions I have because I haven't kept up with the literature. Are we also looking at the recipients to see how coachable are they? And I say this with respect to all of the lovely 52 fellows that I had the pleasure of training. Some were very coachable and some were highly resistant to change. And so feedback was a challenge for, for a third of the group if you break it up into a third, a third, a third. And so I just asked the group, you know, in addition to the quantity uh, is there uh, data to support that this feedback is being effective and are the recipients actually incorporating it for the future? Thanks. Okay. Hey, so, this is Corinne. I, oh, go, I go, Corinne. To, oh, go. oh, no, no, go ahead. I'm, I just said I transitioned to my favorite office, which is my car because I have to pick up one of my children, but please, 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 please go ahead. And then I will chime in. Absolutely. No, no, no. I think you, you can go ahead first and then, and then no. I'll chime in. Is that okay? Sure. So I think that, it, so those two questions could not have been, I feel like it was almost like a plant in the audience because there is, 
there seems to be a lot of work going on right now about quality versus quantity of feedback. And then also thinking about generational learning in terms of the, the learners that we're teaching, you know, we know that there, you know, every generation has different generational needs. And I think that where kind of consensus is right now is this generation wants more feedback, but I agree with you. I think that, um, that, you know, what I have been looking at and what I've been reading about. And so this might be a perfect opening um, for Deb is to say, you know, is, um, is this making a difference? I can tell you like my live life experience as a program director, I do think that now that we are really focusing on observing observed behaviors and we're really talking about those behaviors and we're talking about ways to um, uh, affect behaviors. I think that um, it, it, it is making more change. I think that the feedback that I am noticing that people are really resistant to seems to be more trait-based or dispositional feedback. But again, I, um, I, I have very similar questions and I think that these are, are like perfectly timed questions. So I, I agree, Corinne, with um, your, your observations about, um, about this, this particular generation wanting more feedback. And, but in terms of in your question about are we making a difference in what's being produced, um, I, I don't know that there is an answer to that um, particular question. And, Fish, it sounds like you might have done a little bit more of the lit review on or more recent lit review on this. So please chime in. Um, but uh, what I will say is that um, observation is absolutely necessary. Our setting allows us to provide observation. Um, and during those observation, giving uh, timely feedback as so like a procedure as the procedure is happening giving feedback during then that that allows for correction without necessarily seeming like correction um and and then because i personally have done that for years when when a trainee then asks me at the end of my shift or their shift about you got any feedback for me i say well, you know, every single patient I had with you, remember that feedback, <laughs> remember that feedback, that was feedback. <laughs> um, and, and now that we've, util we've gone to utilizing this, this particular simple format to then, then do the evalu um, written evaluation, um, I, I utilize that particular tool to, to um, provide another opportunity for constructive feedback. And I do think that um, that trainees who are going to take the feedback and who utilize feedback well can dem do demonstrate minute-to-minute um, -minute improvements in their personal skill sets, even during a shift, which is really cool. I'm happy to chime in as well, also recognizing that I am by far the, the least experienced of this panel of educators. Um, and I think outcomes are like the holy grail of educational work, right? You know, trying to actually see like either clinical or long-term educational outcomes is just so hard to do just because there's so many different factors that end up contributing. So it's really hard to say whether this specific bit of feedback or this feedback intervention is what led this person to become an exceptional clinician or to nail this diagnosis is is very elusive and hard to do. Um, I do think though that things like the simple app or things that increase both quantity and quality of feedback, you know, if you think about CBME, it's built on frequent low stakes longitudinal assessment. So even if it's not on your shift, there is like I think I always struggle with the idea that like when I'm giving feedback to someone, like I am in charge of like them as a person. Like I have to be able to comment on every part of them, who they are and make them better. But sometimes it's just being like, I can just say like, hey, next time you suture, do it this way. And that's a huge win. If that's the only thing that I can tell them, that's still an improvement. And someone else, you know, these like kind of CCCs or governing bodies are kind of in charge of then taking these small assessments. Like it's just a data point on a bigger scale that really allows development. So maybe like a single point of feedback won't move the needle much, but it's a lots of little points of feedback that then contribute to huge gains from the learner. And the only other thing that um, 
as I've been reading more that I think is really important is just if you hear about the language of feedback, you know, we talk about delivering feedback, receiving feedback, as if feedback is this kind of like tangible object that one person passes in this one direction to the other person. It's kind of like built into how we talk about it. But a lot more of like the recent literature is really pushing against that, that like feedback is not this unidirectional process, that it really is a dialogue and it should be a conversation. And so things like the educational alliance and what we've talked about, like building these you know, assent and kind of expectations. And it's not just about you being like, hey, do this, but really about bringing the learner into it. And it's like a path you navigate together. And I think, you know, we're starting to see a little bit with core, hopefully that that builds the self-regulation. So even outside of that specific, I gave you feedback, whether it's suit your better or not, that they take, you know, learning skills that they can apply to other settings. It'll be even more important. How you study that is, I think, very difficult, but at least hopefully some potential ways to impact learners. That's perfect. I, I really appreciate these comments, you know, Brad, and just a quick comment and I'll, I'll stop talking is that this is, uh, I'm a big believer in feedback, but these are the comments that I get from other subspecialties and my faculty all the time who are facing evaluation burnout, you know, uh, and, and evaluation fatigue because they're bombarded with all these evaluations. And so I would suggest to this group that since we tend to be a leader within pediatrics as a whole, if we can show that that this type of feedbacks are most effective in moving the needle for the uh, milestones or the EPAs, I think that will be very convincing evidence for the rest of our field. So uh, I'm encouraging this group to, to to take that on because that is what our critics and the curmudgeons in my department are saying to me uh, as they try to fight doing the feedback, saying that you know, as a scientist, what is the effectiveness of this intervention uh, other than your qualitative statements? We believe you, but I really want to know how much. And, and those are the questions that I don't have great answers for. And it sounds like we are evolving towards those answers. And thank you. So the, the challenge to take it up, to take it up the chain has been um, laid out in, in front of us at PEM. Um, so and it, in it's a worthy challenge. Yeah. I, one more comment. I, I I might have misspoke about there's no no data. I I will say that the that spins the specialty pediatrics investigative or investigator network. Um, the the four year is it four yeah four year EPA um, project that we did for all of the pediatric subspecialties. We have um, um, published uh, some papers on on our fellows uh, attaining. Um, improvements in their competency assessment, um, while also providing some validation data for the level of supervision scale. So that that is there. All right. I think with that, uh, we will wrap up the afternoon. Um, Corinne, Fish, Deb, thank you very much. Um, thank you for everybody in attendance. I think we peaked at 71, but I know that many people are watching together. And so on a weekday afternoon in November when everybody's got a lot going on. Um, that speaks a lot to um, you all giving your time um, and attention to our presenters. Um, this will be recorded. Um, it has been recorded. I will get it edited um, and edit out all the swear words and other things and get it up on YouTube to share with the section on emergency medicine um, as soon as I can. I may actually edit the video during my nine-year-old's catching training tonight because baseball is in charge in our house. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, good luck as you conclude um, interviews for fellowships and as residency interviews pursue on. Um, and just take one thing from today um, and take it with you to your next shift um, and give back to those trainees that are working hard for our patients. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>